morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here this morning. Um, as JG uh, announced a few moments ago, I am uh, the new host for Creative Mornings Philadelphia. Uh, prior to this new role, I was a, a board member uh, with Creative Mornings for about two years now. Um, uh, Lyris uh, uh, invited me into the group and uh, it's been a, 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 a very warm welcome and a great experience thus far. Um, and now uh, with that, I'll, I'll talk about uh, today's theme a little bit. Um, so what is free? Free comes in many flavors. Free to come, free to go, free to love, free to, de to deliciously inhabit our own skin. Free to try on all the possible versions of ourselves. Free as in not charging a cent single cent. Free to speak truth to power. Free to say no to what's on our what's on offer. However, to be free, to to dream, to create, to imagine, requires freedom from. To be free from want and fear. To be free from censoring forces. To be free from oppression. To strive for true freedom is to honor our, our obligations to each other, to fight for our mutual liberation. When someone is free to achieve their fullest creative expression, they become a beacon for all of us. How will you make space for your own flourishing and that of others so that the world around you might also bend towards freedom? Uh, th this month's uh, theme, which is free, uh, was uh, submitted by Creative Mornings Charlotte. Uh, now I will introduce our speaker for this month, um, Ban Kosi. Alyssa Horn is the co-founder of Freedom Apothecary, uh, a lifestyle brand with an em emphasis on diversity, representation, and accessibility. With 11 plus years in brand strategy, and innovation at both local and global scales. Also a mother of two superhero boys and a badass little girl and an inherent ultra connector of people. Horn is a community builder and innovator in constant pursuit of truth, pursuit of growth and making the world a better place. On Kosi, it's all yours. That's me, thanks for the intro. Um, and thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here um, and honored to um, have been asked to, to be here. So thanks, Laris. Um, when you asked me, I was kind of like, ooh, really? Me? Why? Um, and I think that that's just the natural state of us as humans is to question why we would want to share our stories or connect with, um, connect with people outside of um, our usual sphere. Um, so thanks for that introduction. Um, I am the co-founder um, of Freedom Apothecary. We're in Northern Liberties. Um, and I know a couple people on here I have met through, um, through having that space. Um, so if we're open, we're a retail space, but we're also, um, we're a spa, we offer community events, we offer tons of different things. Um, and ultimately, like, what you'll learn about me today is um, I love cultivating spaces for people to connect, for people to feel loved, embraced, um, and accepted. Um, so that's kind of, I think that's what grounded us here today um, and planted me ripely where um, where I am. So um, thank you for, for hearing my story um, and maybe taking something away. And thank you for letting me learn from all of you. Um, if you see here in the background, um, as Al Alon spoke to, I have three children. I also have, um, I guess technically I ha also have three businesses. Um, my I have Freedom Apothecary with uh, my business partner, Marissa Jenkins, and then my husband, uh, we have restaurants. So technically they're his, but you know, we're married. So they're also mine. So I have three children and three businesses, which feels a little bit crazy. Um, one of them turns 10 today. Um, so I've been a mother for a decade, which to me is like insane, um, but also really exciting. And it just, um, I think that 
it's shown me so much of who I am. It's shown me, um, yeah, it's just shown me so much. And um, I think that, uh, again, part of our story is all of the things that, oh, thank you. Um, all of the things that have contributed to our lived experience. So um, as with anything that I talk about, I tend to um, get deep. <laughs> JG, you said earlier, um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that to her. I, I don't wanna say I overanalyze everything, but I just think that there's so much more to what we see. Um, and that free, to the theme for this month, um, is, is one of those things. So I pulled, um, I pulled a phrase or I pulled a little segment of what Alan actually shared with us. So he said, um, to strive for true freedom is to honor our obligations to each other, to fight for our mutual liberation. When someone is free to achieve their fullest creative expression, they become a beacon for all of us. How will you make space for your own flourishing and that of others so that the world around you might also bend towards freedom? And I, what I love about that, and I, you know, I, I listened to um, a few other discussions about this um, from Creative Mornings throughout the world. Um, and what I love about that is, um, that there is this shared responsibility of humanity to create and cultivate freedom for others. And that I think is just how I operate um, and how I exist in this world. And one of the things that I am truly committed to is really understanding um, how, uh, how we can be not necessarily of service to others, but in service to ourselves so that we can be for others. Um, and it just made me think about a couple um, of questions that I would love for y'all to think about in this conversation. So understanding what we think freedom means, can freedom exist without oppression? Why do we seek freedom from something? Can we not be fully self-expressed, fully ourselves, living life freely and as we choose to be? Is freedom just yet another way for us to justify certain oppressions that our culture has deemed an acceptable way to live and be in community with one another? So JG, if you could pull up, the um, the little slide. Um, I would love to go to the second. So this is a conversation today. Um, if we could go to the second slide. So free. We all have our own meanings of what free, you know, it, with the definition of free. Um, and I think that, again, um, it kind of allows for us to make sense of the world, right? So free is, um, you know, it doesn't cost anything. It, um, it is, some of the words that are uh, tied to this are untethered, it's untied. So here's a definition of free. And the, I'm gonna pull the very first thing that actually stands out to me. So free is not under the control or in the power of another. So again, that ties us to being under control of someone else. But this is the thing that actually lands with me. Able to act or be done as one wishes. Able to take a specified action. No longer confined or imprisoned. Again, all tied to someone else. Um, not physically restrained, obstructed, or fixed not subject or to or constrained by engagements or obligations, um, using or expending something without restraint, and as a verb, to release from captivity, confinement, or slavery. So out of all of that, there's one phrase and one like definition that isn't tied to someone else. And that is able to act or be done as one wishes. So 
If you could go to the next slide, JG. Freedom. The power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants. And I decided for the purpose of this conversation to cross out without hindrance or restraint. Why? Because our freedom should not be tied to something else. Our freedom should be tied to who we are and how we want to live and how we want to exist within this world. So if you look up these definitions, there are a couple associated words, um, unconfined, unbound, untethered, untied. Um, and what that, mean, what that says to me is that freedom, the most natural state of things is actually to be untethered. It takes action to tie something up. It takes action to tether something. It takes action to bound or, or bind something. So I, I, I ground us in these definitions because I think that we often as humans just create you know, we have an association for what freedom means. Freedom means free from oppression, right? Free from, free from whatever holds us back. And what I would love for us to shift to and what I, I am in the work of right now is shifting to free is us in our most natural state. Freedom is us living our lives as we were intended to live them without the confines of someone else. So next slide, please, JG. So I'm here to share who I am. And that, um, well, I guess you can kind of see at least the color of the rainbow um, in that picture. But the first picture, the largest picture is a photo of my great grandfather. My great grandfather is the chief um, that you see on the left um, with a, we, we don't really know who the man is, um, but it's just, I pulled that in because if I feel like for me, it's actually the perfect example of where I came from. The total opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, my grandfather was a chief of our village in, um, uh, in Tondo Zaire which is the Democratic Republic of Congo now. Um, and so, thank you. Um, so I, I share those because it, it, it really paints a picture of, uh, of what has shaped me in becoming free. Um, so I'm the product of two very different lives. One whose family, um, the Cress family, which is my father is in the smaller picture on the top. He is the one wearing shorts. He wears shorts all year round. In the winter, um, he is shoveling snow in Iowa in short sleeves and shorts, often barefoot. Um, those are my aunts and uncles. Um, the photo on the bottom is obviously from my wedding day. Um, my grandmother, the matriarch of our family is in the center. Um, and she, um, my Coco is just the greatest woman. I'm named after her. Her name was Boncosi. I am her namesake. Um, and uh, I just, this is, this is me. So these are the Cress and Roseberry families, the white families. Um, and then I have the Lobe and Petit family um, is my mom's side. Um, I can only trace back my, um, my the Cress family, my white side, um, for centuries to rural Iowa, um, where I'm from. I'm from Iowa City, Iowa, um, and my father grew up in small town Iowa, and all of my aunts and, aunts and uncles and cousins all still live in rural Iowa. Um, I have another family, my mother's side, whose roots are still firmly planted in the village of Antonio Zaire whose matriarch, my Coco, inhabited this plane for 110 years, uh, spending the last 15 years living in an unfamiliar town in the middle of Iowa, um, knowing two English words 
hi and bye. Um, and uh, my maternal great grandfather, he was the chief of our village. My paternal grandfather, the farmer, a farmer in the Iowa fields. I am one of five products of this specific Peace Corps union. This is not a unique union. This is for the Peace Corps specifically. This is very standard for a lot of people who join the Peace Corps. Um, so I don't, I look at me being the product of this as, oh yeah, this is just standard. Um, but this is also a union that proves to be very unusual in this country where I have personally never fit into the boxes anyone has created for me. So I suppose this is where my journey in identity began. And I imagine where it will end. This is something that as I look back on my life has been something that I have been aware of my entire life. So I was raised in the beautiful, at the time, colorblindness of a liberal college town. Um, where to be honest, when most of my friends were white. I, lit, I spent most of my time with my white side of my family. Um, and on the weekends, um, on more weekends than I can count, you could also find me at African parties um, where Iowa City's collective African community would come to celebrate one thing or another, or sometimes just to celebrate life. Um, that's the beauty of the Af many African cultures is it's just life is a celebration. Um, it was always a loud bustling party with Congolese music blaring from the speakers, children of all ages running about, Africans moving their hips while the white attendees, usually a spouse or a significant other of one of the Africans there, um, made their own attempts to keep up on the dance floor. <laughs> Um, I leave these parties, which was like a child's worth nightmare, smelling of smoked fish, rice, and cassava leaves. My white school friends at one point found out my real name was not Alyssa. Alyssa is my middle name. And that it was instead Bonkosi. Bonkosi is my given name. My parents, um, as Alan can identify with, um, gave us American middle names. So all five of us have American middle names to make it easier for Americans to pronounce our names or connect with us. So my full name at birth was Bonkosi Alyssa Mireille Cress. My friends knew me as Alyssa. They, once they found out that my name was Bonkosi, they teased me by calling me Bonnie a name now only reserved for my closest friends. It's now a name I take like, oh, if you call me Bonnie, we are like matched for life. In junior high, in my attempts to come into my own, as we all do, um, as most seventh and eighth graders do, um, I was teased by the black kids for my hair, which sometimes I wore curly, sometimes I wore straight. And again, seventh and eighth grade, I was just trying to figure out who I was, what I was doing. Like, is my hair curly? What is this? And hair for black and brown women is a very serious thing. It's not just like, oh, we wake up and go. It's, you know, it's, it's something that you have to commit to. My freshman year of high school in PE, um, she, who will re remain nameless, huddled up with her friends, shouted to me, don't you know you're black? I didn't have anything to say because luckily my, my PE teacher, Coach Hollingsworth overheard in that very moment. My junior year of high school for our big project, for our big paper in English class in Mr. Freeze's English, English class, I wrote a paper called Black Enough which is something that a lot of biracial um, and, and mixed children grapple with throughout their lives. Um, we're never enough of one thing or the other. So at the end of the day, we often have a hard time figuring out where we are and who we can be with. Um, and oftentimes it leaves us choosing one side or another. Um, so because I had experienced so many of these things, I was like, well, if I'm not black enough and everyone is saying I'm not black enough, am I white enough? Am I anything enough? 
Um, in college, my black volleyball coach, for one reason or another, didn't like me. I was too happy for her at early bird practice. I was blamed for our conference, uh, our conference tournament losses, um, but she never really liked me anyway. And I think that reflecting on it now, I think that there was, there were, she created a box for me. I didn't fit into the box she expected me to fit into. Years later, as I, you know, I, I get into adulthood, I first started to apply for promotions um, within an organization I ended up working for over a decade of my life. It was overwhelmingly white. Um, I was labeled too cool um, and told that I needed to be more approachable. A year or two later, I didn't get a job um, that I was the only one and final candidate for. I didn't get the job. Uh, for a few, years, a few years after that, I was overqualified. Then I was underqualified. Then I became unapproachable again. And then I created an entire concept for this organization that they decided to take and run with only for to be only to be a pain in the ass a year and a half later. I have never fit into any box anyone has ever put me into because we create boxes that we put others into so that we are comfortable with them, so that we can make sense of them, so that we can define them. These boxes have nothing to do with us and everything to do with everyone else. I have never fit into a box because I've never put myself into a box. Being embodying, living wholly in who we are, that is our true freedom. Embracing our identity, embracing living our lives in the way in which we want and in the way in which we feel most free, that's what we're here to do. So I can't say that I've truly uncovered my own freedom in this way that I'm fully living freely because, hey, we also live in this world of, you know, systems of, I don't want to say oppression, but systems that put us into boxes. Um, but every time I come closer to feeling that sense of freedom, to feeling that sense of, oh, I'm alive, this is, this is what I'm here to do, there is this deep sense of solitude of ease, of flow, of just like, just being that feels good and feels right. So the times and the moments, the interactions, the connections that this is who I've been for myself first, for and, and for others are the times when I feel most deeply connected to something that's bigger than me, something that is my fullest creative expression my fullest expression of myself. Um, and I don't mean, you know, I don't mean something bigger than me in the sense of a, a spiritual sense. I really just mean like, it feels good in my body to be doing what I do and to be living the way in which I want to live and likely, you know, pushing the boundaries, um, pushing the boundaries of what people expect of me, um, pushing the boundaries of what society has put out there. I often um, think about myself as I'm not a realist, I'm a dreamer. Um, and I dream because I know that there could be something better. So me holding on to that and me being so comfortable in, in my own skin and living so freely, I'm able to think about the things that I would want for the world and want for myself. So what I've learned in this process of like of living fully in my body and living and not fitting into anyone's boxes because I don't really care to. Um, as a Midwesterner, um, there is this sense of I, I'm just nice for the sake of being nice, right? I wanna connect with people because I care. I ask you how you are because I wanna know how you are. If there's no ulterior motive, there's nothing I'm trying to get from you. It's because there's a shared sense of humanity that connects all of us. Um, and what I found in that is that the others 
who I, the others who have, uh, there are others out there who identify in the same way, but who've never brought that out, who've never been able to speak it. So I find that when I share these experiences, when I share my lived experience, when I share um, my voice, I'm also sharing the voice for others. I'm bringing, bringing those experiences to life for other people who may not have the ability or the capacity to do that. So I find my freedom, my free self in cultivating community, which is Freedom Apothecary. Um, I happen to um, have a partner who shares a very, who obviously shares a similar vision. Um, and what we have identified is that as black, black and brown women in this world, um, there, there are so many ways in which we can identify. There's so many things that, you know, we have a shared experience, but we also have these very unique experiences in this world. And I find my freedom cultivating a community that celebrates, honors, embraces people for their unique gifts, their unique lived experience that connects us more than it separates us. Why is our own personal freedom our own identity, our own ability to live freely, so closely tied to how comfortable others are with it. Why are we so tethered to this idea that we need to fit into boxes? It confines us. It puts us into a box. There's only so much space in a box. My identity is not rooted in anyone else's comfort but my own. So under everything that we know, under all the things that keep us tethered, that keep us bound, that keep us sequestered in our lives is our freedom. We have a, we have, um, a phrase that we use at, at, um, at freedom that is uncover your glow and find your freedom. Somewhere deep down, there is free. There is freedom. There is yourself that breaks down all of the walls of the boxes anyone has created for us. It's, there's a capacity for all of us to live freely, to be who we are, to be us is to be free. JG, next slide, please. So I am proudly African, very specifically Congolese American. And there, this um, philosophy of Ubuntu is something that kind of, it, it's all over. You'll find this approach to living in community in so many different cultures on the continent of Africa. Um, and Ubuntu roughly translates to, I am because you are. I am because we are. A person is a person through other people. It strikes an affirmation through recognition um, of, of an other in his or her uniqueness and difference. It is a demand for a creative intersubjective formation in which the other becomes a mirror, but only a mirror for my subjectivity. This idealism suggests to us that humanity is not embedded in my person solely as an individual. My humanity is co-substantively co bestowed upon the other and me. Humanity is a quality we owe to each other. We, we create each other and need to sustain this otherness creation. And if we belong to each other, we participate in our creations. We are because you are. And since you are, definitely I am. The I am is not a rigid subject, but a, a, but a dynamic self-constitution dependent on this otherness creation of relation and distance. What if we looked at ourselves through this lens? My survival depends on your, survi your survival. My ability to thrive depends on your ability to thrive. My freedom is directly tethered to your freedom. Would we treat others differently? Would we raise our children differently? Would we create 
differently? Would we collaborate differently? Would we do business differently? This idea of freedom and being us and it's and it connecting to how we move in our lives, in our relationships, in our communities, it really rests on us to be free so that others can be free. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Bon? I'm in. I'm in the tiny video screen. I'm in the. I'm looking at the chat. Cassava leaves are so yummy. Yeah, um, Alan. I'm sure you. I mean, you share it here, but the not only. Is there that struggle of, um, of race? There's also the struggle of um, bicultural experience. Um, and so that I feel like is just, is so common. I think children of immigrants have a very different experience. Um, and I always say like, I am biracial and multicultural. So I have, you know, I am, as a woman walking down the street, you will see me and you'll say, oh, that's a black woman. And being biracial, there are so, it's so nuanced, like so nuanced. And it's not something that is often talked about, but then you layer in the culture aspect. I, I'm not sure if many of you know this, but there is this term called the black card. There's actually a game that, that determines your level of understanding black culture. I don't have a black card. I was not raised in black American culture. I was raised as a Congolese American. And so there was never, again, I go, go back to like the boxes. I was never fitting into anyone's box because I walked down the street and you expect me to be a black American woman. And I don't have that same lived experience as a black American woman. Um, and so that, again, it's just one of those struggles that like people, I've always said to my husband who is a black American man. And so we have like, we've always talked about this, like, this dynamic, but um, I don't care what other people think of me. I don't. As a Midwesterner, I am committed to you liking me and I will get you to like me. At some point you'll like me and I'm okay with that, but I might not be for you because I don't care what box you've put me into. I don't care that you have created these expectations for who I am. So if I'm walking down the street and you see a black American woman and you make these, all these stereotypes about me, that's on you. That's what you've created to make yourself comfortable. It has nothing to do with me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that the bicultural thing or the multicultural thing is, is just another layer to add in because black culture is so strong and that there is an identity in black culture and I don't have it. And I've learned, and that doesn't mean I can't fight or relate or support right but it also means that there's there's an experience that's very different than my own lived experience and what if we just honored all of them bon, I, I, have a, I have a i was like you go i have a question too you go first <laughs> i have a question um so sort of you're you're thinking of like not caring about what other people think about you do you think in any way, did that give you strength to kind of open your own thing and build your own world? Yes. So I, um, I think my, my partner and I are actually such a great pair. She's grounded in reality. 
<laughs> and I'm grounded in anything is fucking possible. Literally anything is possible. And you have to not, um, uh, especially in Philadelphia, there is this um, sense of like almost competition in Philly. It's like, who's doing something better? And I'm like, I, I don't care. I'm just going to like do what I know and do what I want. And what I, what I believe is that that's going to make a name for itself by on its own, right? Like I'm not looking at what's happening everywhere else again, because I'm not making, I'm not fitting into boxes. We, Marissa and I kind of like, because we have such similar, um, we have such a similar vision and like we, what we want to create is like something we've never seen before. And part of that is like, we're just going to do what we know. We know we want, we know that we've never seen and just keep doing it because we're confident in what we have to offer. We're confident that this doesn't exist. We're confident in we created something that we needed. So other people have to need it too. I had a question about your business mm -hmm. and how your, I wonder if you could talk about how your life experience, sort of like how you got to here, sort of influenced the type of business that you decided to start and the philosophy of how you run it. Yeah. So um, it kind of, from my pre, I'll say my previous life um, in my, uh, in the work that I did before was really community-based. Um, and um, I, have always been about creating community, connecting people, um, meeting as I will walk into a room and I will meet as many people as I possibly can. I'll know your whole, I always say, I'll get your life story in five minutes or less. Um, and we will, you're, like once you're in, you're in. And I actually think that that's very Midwestern of me. And it's also very African of me. Um, once you meet my family, you're part of the family. And so I actually, took that into my previous world of creating a community space. Um, I created a space where people could gather, where people could come and just hang out, come and meet. Um, and when I left that, that organization um, and Marissa approached me, what I wanted to create was something similar, but rooted in, um, you know, the conversations that people aren't necessarily having on a day-to-day -day basis. I wanted to, I wanted to push conversations and connections um, that made people think differently, that brought people together, but it also forces you, like you'll come into the shop and you'll likely be there for an hour and we'll probably talk about, we'll talk about um, the public school system. We'll talk about um, race and racism in America. We'll talk about motherhood and the struggles and the strengths of motherhood. Like that's the, the experience that we really wanted to create at Freedom where it was the standard approach for black women is black women are strong. Black women are angry. Black women are never vulnerable. Um, and that's just, those are stereotypes, those are boxes that have made people feel comfortable. Um, and they're also things that kind of um, reinforce that within our lives. So we wanted to create a space where all of those things could be talked about. We wanted to create a space where people could be vulnerable, but also people could connect with other people and bring voice to stories that um, may not be addressed or may not be talked about on a day-to-day -day basis, but they knew that our space was a safe space for that because there were people who were sharing similar experiences. So yeah, I say, I mean, we're a community, we're a retail space, yes, but I always say we're so much more than a retail space. We are shifting dynamics. And that's, that's really our intention is to shift the dynamics for black and brown women um, and also invite others to be a part of our community so they understand where we're coming from. They understand what the lived experience is so that we can all fight for our liberation.
we can all fight for us to live freely as we should. Um, and that's the space that we want to create. There was someone with their hand up. Uh, I don't know if that person still has a question. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, it's Katerina. Um, um, I was wondering, thank you for this talk. Uh, it really resonates with me. I'm German and I've lived here for 30 years and it, um, as you can imagine, it doesn't take much to, for people to have ideas about who you are if you are German <laughs> and uh, putting a uh, talk about putting you into boxes. Um, your space that you created in North Liberties, um, are there programs offered? I mean, discussions offered on a regular basis or is it really just as you walk in and you feel like it, you can talk about the things that you mentioned? So um, we opened in July of 2019. Um, so we opened in July of 2019. Obviously, March 2020 hit. Um, from July of 2019 to March 2020, we had hosted several different conversations. Um, so yes, we do host discussions, but we closed for a full year of in-person shopping. Um, so we took everything online. Um, and now we're looking at what does it look like to either introduce these conversations um, and workshops online and you know, when will we be able to start hosting, comfortably start hosting experiences within the shop? So yes, it serves as a community space. The space was designed so that we could offer different experiences. Um, so we've had book clubs, we've had um, panel discussions, we've had, um, you know, we actually hosted um, uh, a, a black ther a black male therapist for a group of black men to come and talk about um, therapy and why it's not something that's really common within the black community. Um, so absolutely be on the lookout for what that looks like going forward. Um, because yeah, it's, I mean, at the end of the day, like we had to keep our doors open. And so we focused on the business. Um, and also it just, you know, it just didn't make sense. But why we're here is to do stuff like that. We want to be a community. We want to create community. And so, yes, we've done it. We've done it in the past and we'll be redoing it um, come this spring. Bonkosi, <laughs> uh, I had a question. Yeah. Um, and you may have probably, it's probably a version of what you presented today uh, to us. Uh, thank you again to agreeing to, to present and uh, to, uh, you know, uh, this very inspirational talk this morning. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I wanted to know, how do you um, share your, or how, how have you shared your experiences with your children? Um, if they're of age to understand um, these sort of uh, multicultural and cultural um, challenges or opportunities. Yeah, so it's interesting because, so my parents are still in Iowa and we're obviously here in Philadelphia. Um, and so my kids actually experience um, much more of their Black American culture and Black American experience um, than they do my experience. Because my mom is very traditionally Congolese. She, you know, her, she's making, she makes food. Um, most of her food that she eats, most of her diet is actually Congolese food. Um, we, my, all of my family gathers at my parents' house on Sundays and, you know, it's a house full of Congolese people and cousins and, you know, children running around. And so my kids, my kids don't experience that side often. But what I'm really clear about is um, you know, we obviously we've had discussions with our kids about um, about race. And so one of the conversations I, I always go back to is, you know, we do talk about racism um, and we do talk about like, oh, you know, grandpa is white. So does that mean that all white people are bad? No. Um, and, you know, like giving them points of reference in their lives. Most of their friends are actually white. And so they... I, I think that they have this really beautiful experience and that they're selling they're who they are as, as black and brown boys because they're actually a little bit darker than me. They actually, they say that I'm white. 
they look at my skin and they're like, you're white. I'm like, well, technically I am half white. Um, and uh, so when it comes to like race and those conversations, we're having them because they, they see it, you know, they see skin color, they see like experience. We drove through um, in Fishtown in 2020, there was that, um, uh, I forget what they call them, but like South Philly had the Grady Seals we had like something else in Fishtown and it was like, you know, old, older Fishtown people who were um, protesting or protesting against the Black Lives Matter marchers. And so we actually drove through that with the kids and we were able to have a conversation about like, this is why it's happening. Um, this is what you see. Um, and so in terms of race, they absolutely see it. They also know in terms of culture, they know that grandma is Congolese and she speaks Lingala and she speaks Lontomba and French and mommy has this name and the kids actually have middle names that are Congolese. Um, in our tradition, wow. it's, um, our tradition is like the most recent person who passed, the next child is named after that, that person. And so my kids have, um, I have Silas Iyomi and I have Ronan Pax Gweli. Um, so they all have, and then I have, um, my, uh, my daughter is named after my Coco, who you saw, um, and her middle name is Yelene. Um, so we all have like, op I've made sure that they know that we are Congolese, but it is hard, you know, and I think that that's part of the, the immigrant experience is like, it's hard to maintain that culture um, as people get removed from it. Like I hated African food. I never ate it, hated it. So I would never make it here wow. ever hated it to this day. Um, and I, I'm like sh shamed for it, you know, by my family because it's like, you should eat this, but I never liked it. But I think part of that was, it wasn't cool to be different, yeah. you know? So like, as an immigrant kid or, you know, child of immigrants, it's like, you just want to do everything that you possibly can to fit in. So as a little kid, I was trying to like, not be associated, but I was like, oh, whatever. But I'm still like, I knew that I was Congolese and that that's how I spent my time. Like I've got, I've got mud cloth upstairs waiting to be made into dresses for a wedding we've got this summer, you know, like, there's still very much like a lot of culture ingrained in me um, that kids, my kids just get it by proxy. Mm. Yeah, I can definitely relate to the food. Uh, I, I know in elementary school and junior high school, you know, I had, you know, very American um, uh, school lunches and breakfasts, um, then home would be, uh, I don't know, some Haitian dish. Right. Um, and it, it just, uh, to my American brain, um, you know, it just didn't look uh, as appetizing as the American food. But, you know, uh, things have changed and, and I'm open to not just Haitian food and American food, but a lot of different cultural foods. Um, uh, I wonder, uh, are there any other questions as yeah. we, uh, we Susan wind just, down? Susan just asked, is it still that way for children? Um, not cool to be different. I actually think it's probably very different now. Um, I, I'm trying to think of like at my kids' school, if there's any like other cultures, you know, I think that, that they that they find ways to like integrate other cultures into, at least at my kid's school, um, so that they actually have experience and like understand that there's like other stuff out there. Um, so I don't know if it's the same. And I also think that the information, having access to information and being so much more connected than we were then has actually exposed them to a lot more. So I think maybe it's like, it's a little bit less weird. Yeah, that's great. I love to hear that. Yeah. Well, um, if there aren't any other questions, we want to thank Bonkosi for her time this morning. Uh, thank which, you. Which she explained to us was a very 
busy day. I don't know if folks can see the the birthday balloons behind her, but um, <laughs> it's a birthday day in her um, household. Uh, so very busy day and weekend for you. Um, um, thanks again, and for um, uh, the folks um, on on the um, uh, on the chat. Um, we will post this on our website in the coming week uh, so you can watch it again or share it with friends and associates um, and we will have another talk um, next month um, thank you and enjoy the, the rest of your weekend thank you all so much thank you, thank you Vaughn. that was thank gorgeous you. really beautiful thank you yeah thank, thank you, you.